Hi guys, welcome back to another edition of Chats from the Blog Cabin. Today, I actually feel kind of like a kindred spirit with my next guest because she made a major life change at 38. I made a major life change at 50. And so Genevieve, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Hi, Melissa, thanks for having me. Um, sure, I'd love to. Um, I was climbing the corporate ladder. That was my dream right out of college. Just wanted to make it to that 40th floor. I wanted to be the corporate single girl. And I was in New York City in the entertainment business. It was TV syndication. So I was doing promotion for reruns and shows that were um, on the air across the country. And I loved it. I really did. It's, it's what I thought was my path until 12 years in, I was in my co-op and I heard a voice and it came from here. And I knew it came from, from here. I just felt it and it felt so strange. It wasn't a voice here, which I was used to. And this voice asked me, if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? And I was blown away and I realized it wasn't. I was working for money, for status. I was alone and I thought it was all great. And I realized I would be alone. And I realized I missed so much. I missed so much in having my own family and, and meeting someone and settling down and finding a way to make a difference and give back. And all of that came rushing at me moments after that question. And that began the whole journey to and through pajama program to the book and to, you know, all the life lessons that I share that took me 20 some years to really learn. Now let's talk about your book, purpose, passion, and pajamas. I don't know if you can see it, but I, I highly recommend this book. I told you right before we went on, I just finished this book. But there are parts that will make me that will make you cry, especially when you talk about the children that are in the foster home, how you're talking about how they're being they go to go a trial for their um, being a foster or being processed through the system and how you don't think that them being processed is like me being processed. They shouldn't be talked about like that. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I understand the need for. Um, tracking who they are and, and everything. And, and I just, it just broke my heart. I, you know, I was not, I, I didn't know what to expect when I started reading to children in these shelters. I really wasn't prepared for how emotional I would feel being sitting on the floor, reading a story, me in my corporate business suit and these children in clothes that were too tight or soiled, they'd been wearing for days, coming from some trauma that I wasn't privy to. I didn't know how it would rock my world. And it, it, it did. And when, you know, they would be asking for their information and I would once in a while, you know, be there when a new child was brought in or would hear about the judges are going to make a decision and they have their files. And I just thought files and, you know, writing down their information and where were they yesterday and, and who might take them tomorrow? Is their family calling? It was just such, such an impersonal way to take care of a child. Now it, it is necessary for obvious reasons, but I wanted to scoop them all up and say they belong with me. <laughs> That is so true. And so the first time that you went to the shelter, it was just kind of on a whim, wasn't it? Yes. I thought, how can I bring children into my life? And I thought I could read to children in shelters because I saw the news. I read the papers. I knew that there were social workers and police removing children from harmful situations and, you know, and worse and I knew they were bringing them to emergency shelters. And I knew sometimes there was an adult that was taken with them and sometimes not. So I started calling around and I was able to go and read to some of the children at night. And that was my, my, initial, um, my initial work was just volunteering to read to them at night until, until I saw how they were going to sleep in their clothes and afraid. 
and in, in a bare room and, you know, pictures, memories of my bedtime with my mom and my sister and my brothers, it all flashed, you know, right here. And I just, what I was looking at was not that. And what I was looking at to me felt all wrong and, and just heartbreaking. Yeah, um, I actually have a quote and it says, but for the first time I saw what a shelter was, who was, who was brought and most importantly, how awful the circumstances of a child's arrival could be. This new understanding was now my reality. Knowing all this wasn't easy for me, but obviously having to live it as the children did every day was far worse. I wanted to give something to them for those difficult first nights. A pair of warm, snuggly new pajamas and a beautiful storybook filled with pictures would be my lullaby for these children in such pain tonight until I considered what more I could do. I absolutely love that quote. Oh, thank you. I know it. You know, it was, it, I felt it was so little, but I, I, it was the only thing I could do. And to me, I was giving them my heart and I was wrapping my arms around them. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, your late bit in the beginning, you were basically funding all the pajamas and all the books yourself. <laughs> so you probably got a lot of debt out of that, right? <laughs> Yes, if you read my book or if you are reading it or you're going to read it, yes, it's um, it's truthful and it was uncomfortable to write it, but it was necessary because if if I'm trying to reach people who are afraid, like I was, to do something new that their heart's calling, I wanted to share the, the lows as well as the highs. So you're here, you're loaded down with your pajamas, and let's talk about the one instance where you're going to the shelter and you see a police officer taking a child in and the mom's telling them she'll do better. She'll do better. Let's talk about that. Yes, that will never forget. I can never forget that. I just, I was, I was headed to the shelter. I was crossing a grassy uh, park and I heard screaming and I, I didn't know what it was. And as I got closer, I knew I was headed for where there was screaming going on. And, and when I got close enough, but they didn't see me. I saw a policeman running with a little child in his arms and a woman trying to catch up, screaming and running. She's mine. She's mine. Don't take her. Don't take my baby, my baby. And the officer was just running toward a door. And I saw that's the door I'm going in. That's a shelter. And I, I didn't, I, I was starting to piece it together. I said, he, he's taking the baby out of harm's way, it seems. I don't know what the story is. I don't know if she did anything or what she did, but it was just awful to see the pain she was obviously in, whether or not there was a reason for him. Uh, you know, I, of course, assumed there was a reason for him to take the child to safety. And then the door closed and she wasn't allowed in. And she just fell to, to the street, to the sidewalk in front of the door. And it was, I, I was just frozen by an actual incident that I thought, how often does this happen? Mm -hmm. How often, you know, are, is this how, how many children are brought to shelters like this? Well, I just can't even imagine being on the sidelines and watching that because that just seems like it's just so heartbreaking, not only mm -hmm. for the parent, but definitely for the child. And you can imagine the police officer and the shelter staff, they have to be the, kind of like the bad guys, even though they're trying to protect the child. And I never knew if she was trying to protect the child and the police was taking the, the child away from a third party and, you know, didn't know yet who she was or, or her part in it all. There are so many questions that were, you know, were coming up in my brain and I, I don't, I didn't have any answers. So before we get into a little bit more about the story, tell us exactly what the pajama program is. Sure. Well, what happened after I started to bring these pajamas to the children and one night I was handing them out uh, one of the first times and a little girl didn't want them. She was afraid and I could tell she had been through some trauma and she asked me a pretty simple question, but it rocked my world. And I became obsessed with giving children pajamas, children who didn't have any, and just trying to soothe them. Every time I told the story and told people what I was doing, the support was amazing. You know, I didn't expect it. 
I knew I, I had this obsession and it was really growing and really worrying me because my heart was calling me there and my brain was saying, you need to pay your rent. You need to pay your mortgage. You need money. What are you going to do? Don't think that you can just drop this career thing, you know, but my heart was saying, yes, you can. We'll figure it out. This is, this is important in life. And the more I was out there doing this, talking about these children, the more people wanted to help. And when it became obvious that books and pajamas and cash were arriving because of a magazine article that came out, boxes flooded my one bedroom and I opened an envelope with tears from opening boxes and seeing what people's reactions were. And the letter said, if you send us your 501c3, we'd like to send you a grant. And I, I said, and I had just got married. I met a great guy from being single. You know, you're on purpose. The universe helps. Mm -hmm. And the letter said, send us your 501c3. And I looked at him and I said, what is this thing, 501c3? And when I realized the responsibility that I now had, because these people trusted me to continue the work, I realized then this has to become a national, it has to become a nonprofit legitimately. And Pajama Program was born. And I love, it's just simple pajama program. You wouldn't really think about it, but it's so simple and so yeah. some necessary for kids in shelters because they come in and they basically, like you said, have to wear the clothes that they come in with and may not have a change of clothes or they may be somebody else's clothes that they right. grab. So it's used clothes, something of their own, something to give them dignity and value. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I just honestly, and so this started little you in an apartment working out and then it started growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And when did you decide that you had to let go of your day job and do this full time? Um, well, if I, if I didn't make the move, I would have been fired. It was becoming clear to everyone that I wasn't really paying attention. My, my heart wasn't in it and my head wasn't even in it anymore. And I was making mistakes and, you know, just the, 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 dedication that I always had for my career was dwindling and it was very obvious. So I started to take project work instead and thought, okay, I can do both. I can do project work and then I can do my pajama thing on the side, but it didn't last very long. And I said one night to my husband, I'm not sleeping. I think I'm going to have to just make the jump and if I have to work at a fast food or McDonald's nearby, I will do it. Just pay my half of the bills. And I would have done it. And he said, let me see. Let me see if I can, I'll, I'll carry us. And he somehow, you know, had a great year. At that time, he was an actor working jobs and it's feast or famine. And he made it work and it had a great year. And that was the beginning. And I was in debt and it was um, difficult and painful to have to pay that off with, you know, his generosity of, you know, just what he was contributing. I had to find a way to make it work and cut back. And I was happy to do it, but I didn't realize the seriousness of all that debt. Yeah. Along the way, you were met with some angels in disguise kind of, you know, people were offering like office space and things like that. So let's talk about that, how that helped motivate you moving forward. It, it's always, you know, the theme that I talk about in my book is the power of the human connection. And I say when I speak now and when I coach people, I say, it's not the power of one. We're taught that. I said that too. Look at all the things one person thought of and does do. It's not the power of one. It's the power of one another that moves mountains and moves people. And I think that's important now. And that's what happened over the last 23 or so years. Pajama program is officially 20 years old next year. But for almost three years before, it was me on the street like Santa Claus with a sack of pajamas. And all through that time, it was these strangers. So um, my husband's friend saw 
the apartment I had and now that we were both living in piled up with boxes all the time. And he said, I have a cubicle at my architectural design firm. You can have it until I hire someone. And I grabbed it and stayed for a year. And then he had to tell me, um, I hired someone. And then I called up one of those places that rents offices in suites and their headquarters was in um, England. And I faxed a letter telling them what I was doing and they faxed back and they said, we have a small office. We'd be happy to donate for a year. Wow. I mean, it's just people felt it. People felt that story that people felt that little girl's loneliness and that hole that I think we all feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that, and that drew them to help. Wow. I'm just, it's also drawn you to a lot of different things like um, meeting different people. Like I was really impressed with Meredith Vieira. She was the very first mom that you honored, right? Over mom of the year. I was impressed with, totally impressed with that because I loved her on The View. So let's talk about some of the other encounters that you've had. Yes. You know, it's so funny because I, I firmly believe when you're on purpose and you are doing what you were meant to do and you are free in, in any of those um, traditional job responsibilities and you are building something that feels right and is right and of course is helping others, that the universe has your back, right? The universe is always there mm -hmm. and it seemed to be there for me, you know, in synchronicities and things. And I had always, like you, admired her and wanted mm -hmm. to have her come to one of our luncheons and, and you know, present her with Mother of the Year Award. And my husband and I went to an afternoon matinee and there she is online with her kids. And he said, go talk to her. And I said, what, are you kidding me? He said, it's your chance, she's right there. And I gathered my courage and I went and I told her in a couple of sentences what I was doing and what I was asking of her. And she gave me her phone number, her assistant's phone number and said, give my assistant the call and give her the information and we'll get back to you. And it worked out. Wow. I'm just like, I'm in awe that you obviously have to have a lot of brave, be brave in this type of um, industry or in this, in creating this program, because you had to step out of your comfort zone a lot, didn't you? Yes. Yes. But when you're obsessed, you do crazy things. And I was obsessed. <laughs> Now, there's a part in your book where you talk about your mom was always like your biggest cheerleader right there behind you. But your dad was kind of like on the fence, like most dads, I think, being kind of a little bit protective of their little girl. Yeah. So let's talk about how you um, how your family feels felt before you started the program or as you were starting and how they feel now. Yeah. You know, um, to take it a step before that. I wasn't telling anybody what I was doing because I hadn't figured it out myself. And I knew how it sounded. I'm, I think I'm going to quit my job because I want to give pajamas to children who don't have them. You know, even to me, it sounded crazy. So I wasn't ready to tell anybody. And when I thought I was, I chose somebody who was uh, also a career woman, who was a friend, not in my career and didn't know my bosses. So I knew I would be safe. And I wanted to see what... A, person would say. So we went out for drinks and I started saying, and I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't talking gibberish, but I could hear how it sounded to another career woman, what I wanted to do. And she looked at me and she said, why would you want to do that? You've built this career. Do you think pajamas are going to solve the problems of these kids? You've built this, you've built that. I don't understand. And I was just flattened. It it was heartbreaking to me. I I was doubting myself. I had no answers for her. I realized how it sounded. Mm -hmm. And it was it was so difficult for me to pick myself up and go to someone else. But I went to my mom. I did go to the man I was going to marry and I had to say to him, I know where, where we're headed. I feel that way about you too, but I need you to know that I'm thinking about leaving my job for this pajama thing you've heard me talk about. And he said, go for it. Yeah. So that at least I had that. And after this woman just, you know, just made me rethink 
my my own confidence, I went to my mom and she said, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I trust you. It's a beautiful idea. I know you'll do it. And she's always been my North Star. So I felt so much better. And I was okay with my dad being worried and asking me the hard questions. And I said, I don't have any answers right now. But I say one of the one of the heart of the matter takeaways at the end of every chapter, one of them is to gather your cheerleaders so that if there is someone who's a naysayer, knocks you down, you can get up so much faster than if you don't have your cheerleaders in order. Yeah. I love the heart of the matters um, at the end of each chapter. It's like little snippets, like little pieces of advice that av advice that you can actually just kind of take away in your brain. I mm. honestly, I think on those, because I had, I had my book on Kindle, I could highlight every, I think I highlighted every, every one of those oh. bits because you have some great advice. And I love how you said, by being vulnerable, we discover we are not alone as well. Cause that is mm. so true. There's so many people out there that are like, they they want to be perfect online and offline that they're not allowing people inside to see who they really are. Perfectly said, you're right. And so let's talk about vision boards cause you're a firm believer of vision mm. boards. So let's talk I about sure vision am. boards. Yeah, yeah, I, I teach a, I teach a course on on vision boards because I do think that they're motivating, inspiring, and invisibly magical. I think, you know, the number one rule that I think is the the number one rule is you have to feel the pictures. They have to call to you. You can't start out with a big piece of poster board and magazines and your computer to look up more pictures and say, okay, I want a picture of a beautiful house and I want it to be brick and I want it to do this and then go look for that house. I think the opposite, I think you know what you want your life to feel and look like. And when you look through pictures casually and you see what's on it and something will call you, it might be a, a pet, it might be a car, it might be a house, it might be a word, it might be a picture of a family. Whatever calls your heart is when you cut the picture out. Mm -hmm. And you will see that it will become a life together on the poster board. There will be a family area, there'll be a home area, there'll be a travel area, there'll be whatever you might feel if you love animals or you love playing the piano or you love teaching those pictures of your life are already in your heart and they will find you if you look through the pages and you see that they will jump out at you. Now, when you started the pajama program, was there a vision board that you had created or no? Well, there was. And in the book, I talk about my husband taking me to a park and sitting on a, bed, a bench and telling me to visualize getting on Oprah. And I laughed at him. I said, yeah, me and a million other people want to get on Oprah. And he said, come on, see it, see it, visualize it, make your vision board. And I, I knew what a vision board was. I didn't have one yet, but don't you know, I made a vision board and I put Oprah right on there. And then what happened? <laughs> and then they called. <laughs> now this was after you've already been in O Magazine, correct? Yes, yes. I had, um, I got a note from a woman that I went to college with that I knew just a, a little bit. And she had read about what I was doing in our very small local newspaper. And she wrote to me and she said, I'm thinking of starting my own PR agency. I'd love to do some free publicity for you, see what I can get. Cause I think what you're doing is nice. And I'm starting my own agency. So of course I said, yes. So we met and she was wonderful. And I did remember her and she was so hardworking and determined. And she somehow, I was blown away. She called and said, you have an, you have an interview with one of the reporters at O Magazine. I said, oh my gosh. So it still wasn't confirmed. I met with them. I told her my story and I was thinking, they must hear a million of, you know, do-gooder stories. I don't know what they think, if mine's any different. So I didn't have my hopes up. But when I left, I 
I got notice that they were going to run the article and they did. And that was a few years before they called for the show. And apparently people were calling in. When the magazine came out, we got lots of chapters from around the country, lots of volunteers calling to say, can I open a, a volunteer chapter here and here? And so we got dozens of chapters from that magazine because it's Oprah Magazine, O Magazine. And then a few years later, they said people had been writing in and they you know, interviewed me for a couple of weeks on the phone. I didn't tell anybody. And then I got to be on the show. How could you not tell anybody? I mean, to me, that would be like the worst secret. I could, I could not have kept that secret. No, no, Melissa, you know what would be worse? Telling people and then having to tell them they decided not to fly me in to go on the show. Yeah. I, I couldn't. Every time I thought that would be worse, I can hold this because I would dev be devastated to tell people that I wasn't going to go on. Now, when you went That's on. Why. Yeah. When you went on Oprah, she actually kind of, I love the story, the setup to begin with, where you're talking about the production assistant was taking you all through the hallways and not, you're like, this girl doesn't know her way around. And <laughs> because Oprah had a surprise for you, right? Oprah had a surprise for you, right? Yes. It was an amazing reveal that is revealed in the book and it was a totally different um storyline shall we say than they prepared me for because they didn't want me to know what was actually going to happen i'm honestly i was like wow do you think that's what launched you into the next level with that oh, yeah. amount of visibility that she gave yes it's a game changer you know they're what they say about the o effect Oprah effect. It's so true. It's it's an amazing game changer. And the show did really, really well. I mean, it was a big surprise, a big, great, a great show. And they aired it three times. That's, that's really surprising that they've aired it yeah. three times. I mean, yeah, that, I know that's really something. So how many, how can people get involved with the pajama project? Um, it's pajamaprogram.org, so they can find all of that there. They can find me at Jen at GenevievePaturo.com, and I can fill in, I can make an introduction, or I can talk about um, any of the, um, anything anybody's thinking about when they're, if they want to start something new or share anything like that. So I'm happy to help and introduce them or, you know, be an ear for them. Also, let's start talking about, okay, when you started the pajama program, it was just you. Did you imagine it would get as big as it is now? Never, never. And I wanted to write this book um, maybe 15 years in because I saw the power of of people and, and how one story, you know, in the book, it talks about that question from that little girl, how it changed everything and how everybody reacted to it and to her and all the magical things that happened that are, there's no logical explanation for why things would have happened. Only that if you're on purpose and you share and people feel that emotion that, that great things can happen and things can change. And so being founder and executive director was, um, 24 seven, because I didn't think we'd grow the way we did. Mm -hmm. And I'm not good at the legal or the, you know, the financial stuff. And I had to, you know, of course, get attorneys and get those professional people. And I was spending more and more time at my desk and less time out, which is my favorite part, talking about the story and talking about people's magic and the human connection and, and all those emotional things that that I wanted to keep alive for a pajama program. So I asked the board if we could hire an executive director so I could leave that position. And we did. And she's wonderful. She's an attorney. So she knows how to do all the stuff that wasn't, you know, my favorite stuff to do. So, um, so I'm, I'm so proud that we could make the transition and I could be out there with my book and speaking and helping to, I hope and pray, inspire people to listen to their heart voice and to, and to make that change in their life. They don't have to make a jump like I did. 
not always the smartest thing, but I, <laughs> I said, but I did. But you know, I talk about making a slide, and I teach people how to slide what's calling them, what's bringing them joy into their life. And right now, you know, I, I say let's not keep it on the back burner, or worse, mm -hmm. put it farther back. Let's bring it up for, you know, even an hour a week, bring it into our lives and have that hope alive. Now, how has COVID changed the way that you run the pajama program? Um, well, yeah, like I said, Jamie and the staff are running it and, and obviously doing everything that um, they can and we can, but we have reading centers that aren't open now because the children can't assemble. We can't bring them in and read to them and give them pajamas. So um, we're doing virtual readings on social media for the children who can watch, who can, people can find a way to, to invite the children to, to see that and listen to the stories that way. And we're certainly still delivering and, and sending pajamas to these children through our 63 chapters around the US and volunteers are still are still at it. So if someone wants to start a chapter, do they just contact the pajama program? Yep, there's a place that says chapters and there's a place to contact people, yes. I'm just, I'm in awe of everything that you've done. I mean, I'm reading a stat right now. It says the pajama program has donated over 7 million pairs of new pajamas and books to children in need throughout 63 chapters in the US. Did you ever think it was going to be 7 million when you started? No, never in a million years. No, nope. never in 7 million years. <laughs> <laughs> and still more to come. Yes. So is there one thing looking back on that you would have done differently? You know, I always say, imagine what we could have done if I started when I was 28 or 25, mm -hmm. but you know, you're you're only ready when you're ready, and it wasn't it wasn't time. It was time when I was 38. I I guess I got to that point where the universe said, "Okay, we've been trying to give you signals. Now we're gonna, you know, knock you over the head with this question that's gonna spook you out." But get on track, lady. And so I think I think I have to make peace with the fact that I was 38 and did the best I could at, from 38 till now. Yeah, I will say, I, I'm not sure how much of my story you know, but I just started these chats from the blog cabin during COVID, like March of this year. And I've always been one that hates to be in front of the camera. I was always the one behind the camera. So mm -hmm. now look at me. I am like talking to people all the time on camera now. <laughs> and I'm 52. So <laughs> time was right. Yep. Time was right. <laughs> you listened. And anxiety ridden. Oh my gosh. So much anxiety. <laughs> So is there one thing that you wish that you have for the dreams of the future that's on your vision board now? Um, sure, sure, sure. Lots of lots of things. Um, I, I just I don't know if it's not on my vision board, but it's it's in it's on my mind all the time and it's in my heart. I just I hope people will will listen to their heart voice. I hope I can get through to as many people that will listen that it's never too late, as you know. Mm -hmm. And if you ask and you ask your heart, you ask yourself, what is it I'm meant to do? And you listen and you trust that maybe it is playing the piano. Maybe it is teaching. Maybe it is landscaping. Maybe it is, maybe it is, maybe it is. It probably is if it's if it's calling you. And I just hope every day that people don't push that dream farther back, but bring it up closer. Now, in your bio, you talk about not only being a professional speaker, which obviously you go and share about your the pajama program, but as a consultant as well. What how do people get you as a consultant? Yeah, it's one on one and it's about it's like personal strategizing. So what's going on in your life? What do you what can you do? What do you want to do? Is it a jump? Is it a slide? And all the things that all the steps that we need to take together so I can be that support and that ear and getting them right up to the point where they feel 
that they have meaning in mm -hmm. their lives and that they're on purpose. Too many people are, are feeling they have no meaning. They're living and working with no meaning. And you can have a great job and find meaning in it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize that you can, but you can. And I try to show um, it, everybody's different how to make it right for you. Well, I'm just, I'm totally in awe because I just, after reading this book, I'm in all the highlights. I mean, I highlighted all this stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, if I had a uh, marker instead of the Kindle, it would have highlighted everything. I mean, it would have been <laughs> because it was really just being vulnerable and just talking about your mission mm -hmm. statement and um, convinced. That one of the things is on paper, I've been convinced that my life was everything I ever wanted, but life isn't lived on paper. It's lived through action as directed by our hearts and our minds. That was one of the quotes that really stood out for me as well. Mm -hmm. But you're right there, Melissa. You need to write a book. You're right there. You're living it. See, see, and I don't think that. So here we go. <laughs> you are. So let's talk real quick before we get off about the pajama program again and some of the cool things that you've got to do through them, like the Nastic, ringing the Nastic bell, because I think that was super cool. Yes, it was very cool. Yeah, and um, there's a picture. There was um, one of our volunteers brought her a little boy. We had our friends and family come, and they invited some up near the um, desk where the bell is. And he was just here, and his mom was or his dad was holding him, and he saw the button. And I could see. I was waiting for the gentleman in Nasdaq to tell me when to push, and I could see him. He wanted to push it. And as soon as the gentleman said, push it, I took his hand and I, he and I pushed it together. And that was so much fun. He loved it. And I loved it. And I think everybody loved it. Yeah. I love the fact that you brought a child in because that's basically what your program is all about is children. So you want to make Volunteers sure knew they could bring their kids. And we have some comments. One says, so, so good. Ask your heart and listen. Don't push your dream back when it's calling you. Yeah. And then do it scared. That's right. That's Feel fantastic. the fear, do it anyway. Yes. That's that person fantastic. Right. Heartbreaking. I think this is when we were talking about um, when we were talking about the children in the foster care system and having to be like processed yeah. out. Yes. Heartbreaking. And this one is kind of, I think we were talking about your mom and dad. It says moms are typically all in with the emotional side decisions. Dad, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Now, so what does your husband think about this? Because in the book, you talk about in the beginning, he was like, you, you've got to do something because we can't live like this. Because you you were saying that you're like he was making his little office desk was like a whole bunch of boxes that he would put on top and you would work in the bedroom. He would work in the living room and you'd have to find a maze through your apartment to get mm -hmm. through the boxes. So what did he think of all this once it started blowing up? You know, he he's the hero of my book because we fought and I get into it in the in the book and I took advantage and um, I was you know 24 seven, you know, blinders on, had to get it done, had to do more every day, didn't sleep. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a very good partner. I wasn't, you know, I'm sure it wasn't what he and I promised to him. I was just totally um, sidetracked. And he, he tried to, you know, be there and he tried to understand. Um, sometimes I pushed him too far. Sometimes I didn't understand why he didn't get it just like, you know, and, and say, yeah, I'm jumping in. I'm going to be obsessed just like you. You know, he was trying to hold things together that were falling apart that I didn't want to look at. So, you know, it was, it was trying, it was trying, but he was, he was always there. And in our worst fights, he, if we had a shelter and you know, we were supposed to leave at three o'clock, we went, he took me and he waited outside, no matter what, you know, what uh, we'd been through that day or no matter where we were financially or any other way, he was always there. And I talk about how he wrote my mission statement. He put it into words so beautifully and, you know, hiding in the bathroom, and 
um, it, you know, he lost a lot of sleep and um, he, he sacrificed a lot and he, you know, he's, he's my hero. Now, when you first, you already said that you were like dating him when you first started or first started thinking about this. So the early years of marriage are already tough already. And then you're throwing that in the mix as well. How long before the pajama program really took off where you were actually not having to, to pull out of your own pocket to buy mm. then did it take um about five years wow because yeah it was long it was long it was long um it was it was it was hard but i that was my world i didn't know how to fundraise all i knew how to do was tell tell the story and i was so grateful to receive any support whether it's pajamas books or checks and even when we got our 501c3 you know, I talk about in the book, I didn't know how to have a fundraiser. I didn't even know how to ask people for money. And, you know, I, I had to stop being afraid to ask for help. Wow. Oof. You have left us with a lot of gems and I highly recommend her book. Guys, you will not regret it. It's called Purpose, Passion and Pajamas. How to Transform Your Life embrace the human connection and lead with meaning. And I actually, like I said, I just finished it this morning. I really was like, I have to finish it before I interview her. Cause I'm like, this is so good. I started reading it, I think Saturday. And I was like, it's so good. And it's not that long. No, it's a quick read. Um, thank you for reading it. And thank you for, for making this like a nice French friendly conversation. That's what the whole point of the chats. That's why I call it chats. I don't really feel like it's an interview. I feel like it's chats. I'm just having a I, conversation with somebody you might meet on the street. Who knows? Yes. Not yes. I thought that way. But of course, not everybody gets to talk to Oprah either. So <laughs> I feel so grateful. I do. I mean, it, it was just, it was amazing. It was amazing. And she is, she's talking about a gem. She is. Yeah, she is a gem. So is there anything else you want to leave us with before we leave? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I offer to, to talk to people if, you be, if you're in touch with me. I'm, I'm a good listener. And um, I always say, if I could do it, you can do it. So how can people find you then? Um, GenevievePaturo.com. You can contact me there or my email is Jen, which is G-E-N -G at GenevievePaturo.com. Just email me. And social media? Do you have social media handles? All like of them. Community? Yep. They're all on my website. They're all, you could just look up Genevieve Paturo or even Google Pajama Program founder Genevieve and you'll be led to me. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I know a lot of listeners, one already said they're already planning on getting your book. Oh, that's and nice. Thank to my you. heart today. Thank you. Going to read the book. And she will read the book because I know this person personally. She will read oh. the book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, this person. <laughs> <laughs> it's Laura. So, thank you, Laura. Uh, so I want to thank you for coming on and for sharing part of your time with us today. Thank you so much, Melissa. And congratulations. You are an example. I actually do. I actually will tell people that she does do a, a call in and I actually have one scheduled in December with you. I, I went online yesterday and was checking out your website and I was like, oh, I'm going to go and slide into her calls. <laughs> good, good, good. So, all right, guys, we'll see you on the next chat from the blog cabin. Bye.